It was terribly cold that November day. It didn't help that Sam was suffering from a bad cold. He was completely miserable. The problem was made worse by the fact that he had to work outside in the cold. Sure, he could have stayed home and been sick like so many others, but that was never his way of avoiding work. It was his family's company and he always gave his all to everything he did. One day he heard someone say, if it's worth doing, it's 100% worth doing. He never called in sick unless he was physically unable to work. This only happened twice. Both times it was because he was in the hospital. At 10 o'clock, he felt his body begin to give out. He realized that he simply could not continue. Arturo, his foreman, took one look and practically forced him into his truck with the words, Go home, Samuel. You are of no use now. And eventually the whole team will become infected from you. That's how Sam found himself sitting in his truck parked on the street in front of his house 20 minutes later. He parked on the street because he returned home to find his brother's truck in the driveway. This was strange for three reasons. First, his brother had to be at work. Secondly, Jimmy had no real reason to be in Sam's house without Sam being present. Third, the reason Sam was with the team in the first place was because he was covering for Jimmy, who was supposedly in a nearby town meeting with a potential client. Of all the possible reasons why Jimmy's truck was in his driveway at this time, Sam couldn't think of one that was acceptable. He entered the house and quietly climbed the stairs to the bedroom. The closer he got, the more clearly he heard sounds that he would never want to hear. Oh God, yes, Jimmy. Camilla's voice came through the open bedroom door. Thus, Sam's suspicions were confirmed. Damn bitch, Sam thought, switching the phone to video mode and pointing it at the open doorway. Jimmy made me cover his ass so he could pat my wife's ass. Let's see how he likes it when I kick his ass. None of the lying lovers noticed how the enraged figure of the deceived husband silently entered the room and stood at the foot of the bed. After waiting three heartbeats to time it just right, Sam launched a kick. Jimmy's universe changed in an instant. Looking back, Camilla felt horror when she saw the mask of rage on her husband's face. Sam managed to pull himself together as he rounded the bed and saw his older brother curled up on the floor in agony. He realized that any further retaliation at this point could land him in prison. As for Jimmy, he was terrified. He knew he had less than zero chance against his little brother. Even if it had been a fair fight, Sam would have torn him apart. He remembered Thanksgiving two years ago. Jimmy, being the older brother, always knew how to handle Sam. Unfortunately, Jimmy mellowed out a bit, working mostly behind a desk. Sam, however, preferred to be outside with the crews and help with the construction. Thus, Sam gained a lot of power, while Jimmy lost a lot. Jimmy always liked to joke with Sam about how, being older, Jimmy would always be able to handle his little brother. That day, Sam defied his older brother right in front of Jimmy's wife. They will have an arm wrestling competition. Jimmy, thinking it was funny that Sam actually defied his older brother, let his overconfidence lead him. Okay, it's time to show my little brother who's boss again. Jimmy grinned at his wife. Jimmy and Sam walked over to the table and sat down. Oh, damn, Jimmy muttered. No matter how hard Jimmy tried, he couldn't move Sam. Sam just sat there and grinned. His biceps flexed, but Jimmy knew Sam wasn't giving it his all. He looked at Sam's face and saw that Sam was just playing with him. Jimmy saw that he was about to be thoroughly humiliated in front of his wife and entire family. He saw in Sam's eyes all the humiliation and bullying that he inflicted on his younger brother. He could see that Sam was enjoying this little payback. Sam even went so far as to lower Jimmy's hand halfway and look at his watch before returning it to its neutral position. The humiliation was complete when Sam yawned boredly and effortlessly took Jimmy's hand and placed it on the table. After this, Jimmy vowed revenge. The truth is, Jimmy deserved what he got. He bullied his younger brother all his life. No neglect could go unpunished. Jimmy got divorced before next Thanksgiving. His wife hired a private detective and caught Jimmy having an affair. Six months later, Camilla and Sam were married. My father Jacob started his own construction company when I was three years old. He created it as a corporation, 
but all shares were owned by family members. My mother, Evelyn, started out as an accountant. I had one older brother, Jimmy, whom I introduced earlier, and a younger sister, Stephanie, or Steph as she preferred. For the most part, we were happy. My parents loved us, and we loved each other. Jimmy was something of a bully and rarely missed an opportunity to outdo me in his position as big brother. Steph was the favorite child in the family. She was not only the youngest, but also a girl. Of course, my parents spoiled her. To me, she was a bitch. So my older brother was the heir apparent, and my sister was a spoiled brat. I was the middle child. Of course, my parents loved me, and I loved them. They didn't really have a favorite. At least I'm sure they didn't think so. But my older brother was still the heir apparent, and my younger sister was the favorite child in the family. In terms of siblings, my brother was the big brother, and always made sure I didn't forget that. My younger sister seemed to view me as something more than an inherited, useful servant. I'm sure my parents didn't realize what they were doing when they demanded that I drive her after I got my driver's license. It doesn't matter that I didn't get the same benefits when my older brother got his driver's license. So, I understand that you will think that I am whining or feeling sorry for myself. This is not the case. These are simple facts. I knew who I was and what the situation was. I wasn't mad at my parents yet. That's just how it worked. Everyone has their place in the family. I was the middle child. I gradually began to understand this. My older brother would eventually take over the business. Here's how it works. My little sister would be taken care of. That's how it worked. I was the middle child. I'll have to go my own way. I knew it. So here I was, married for almost a year and a half, finding my older, divorced, cheating brother having sex with my wife in my house in my bed. There is no need to go into detail here. Jimmy grabbed his clothes and ran out the door. It took Camille 20 minutes to pack her things, and she left too. The house was mine before we met, so it was not part of any public property. We had a prenuptial agreement, so I simply signed a power of attorney with my lawyer, laid out my terms to him, and left town. My lawyer sent me the final divorce decree in six months. Okay, so it looks like everything went smoothly. That did not happen. Of course, I left the city, but I didn't go very far. I went to talk to my parents. I showed them the evidence. They told me I needed to get over it. Jimmy was going to take over the company, and I needed to leave it for the sake of family harmony. My sister also joined them. Sure, Jimmy was an asshole, but that was just a minor blip on the path to a greater good. If I clicked on them, I would lose. Let it go and be happy for Jimmy and Camilla. To make matters worse, Camille moved in with Jimmy that same night. I was told not to make waves. Jimmy was the chosen one. It was very obvious that I was alone in my struggle. I vowed never to return until I had my revenge. Look, Jimmy will take over the company in a few years. Yes, we are disappointed with what he did, but we are not going to disown him. Deal with it and get in line. Don't try to make us choose between the two of you. He is the heir. Deal with it, my parents told me. My sister, even the bitch, intervened in the conversation. Sam, so she had sex with your brother. So what? She just decided to change. Actually, I can't blame her. Just come to your senses and make sure Ramsey's report is on your desk by Monday morning. When I finally confronted Camille, things only got worse. It started about a month after our wedding. She admitted it. She also said that most of the times I covered for Jimmy, it was so he could go and have sex with her. To make matters worse, she told me she was pregnant and the baby was Jimmy's. I was an innocent victim here, but my whole family sided with the scammers. I watched as my family welcomed Jimmy and Camille with open arms. I watched as everyone pretended that I never had any relationship with my own wife. I listened as my family fawned over Camille and congratulated Jimmy on becoming a father and giving my parents a grandson. All this while I was quietly pushed aside. My divorce was barely mentioned and was only talked about in general terms as it related to the timing of Jimmy and Camilla's marriage. I was extended invitations to family dinners and parties, but it became very obvious that this was done more out of a sense of duty than because I was actually wanted. As long as I showed up for work and did my job, that was all they really seemed to care about. 
The last time I saw my family for the next 10 years lasted exactly 3 minutes and 30 seconds. It was for Thanksgiving dinner. I arrived late in the evening, walked in and began my greetings. As you can guess, they were far from pleasant. And just as quickly they showed me the door. I swore two things. First of all, I would leave and never consider these people family again. Secondly, one day I will return and destroy them for what they did. This was my family. These people were supposed to love and respect me. I did everything I could to be a good son and brother to them, but they turned their backs on me when they should have hugged and comforted me. Somehow I will return and burn their world to the ground around them. Would I show them the same mercy that they show me? Never. Two weeks later, Damn it! Where the hell is Samuel? Came a cry from Jacob's office. What's wrong? Evelyn asked worriedly, rushing inside. True, she hadn't seen her middle child in a while, but she just assumed he was still sulking about what happened. She actually felt a little sorry for him, but she just couldn't go against her eldest son. Ultimately, he was chosen to lead the company. The Geraldson project is a month behind schedule, and the Mandelson building inspector is demanding that we take all of last week's work and completely redo it. This will cost us at least $50,000 and another two weeks to fix. Why the fuck did Samuel let this happen? Jacob shouted. First of all, Stephanie said, entering the office, Geraldson's project is Jimmy's, not Sam's. So I don't understand why you're blaming him for this. Secondly, I haven't seen or heard from Sam in the last two weeks. He's not answering his calls, and his foreman just told me he hasn't seen or heard from him in the last couple of weeks either. Sam knows damn well he has to cover Jimmy on this project. Damn it. He'd been working on this for the last six months, so he should get used to it. Find him and tell him I'm waiting for him in my office so I can kick his ass real good first thing in the morning. It's time for him to put an end to this whining and get to work. The next morning, an anxious Stephanie was in her father's office. She sent more than 20 text messages and left several voicemails on Sam's phone. She even went to Sam's house to see if she could talk to him. Now she had to explain to her angry father and the rest of her family what she had found. Where the hell is Samuel? I told you that you should have seen him here first thing this morning, but I didn't see him. Jacob frowned as he looked around the room at his wife, eldest son, Camille, and daughter. Well, um, he, um, left, she stammered as she spoke. Left? What do you mean left? asked her mother. I mean left. I don't know where, but he left. He doesn't answer text messages or phone calls. He doesn't answer voice messages. Yesterday I even went to his house and found that he had moved out. When I walked in, there was a cleaning crew there and they told me they were preparing it for new residents. It looks like he's renting it out now, she explained. Are you trying to tell me that he abandoned his family? Jacob practically screamed. Stephanie had a rather restless night following her discoveries. Not being able to sleep made her remember quite a few things that had happened and been said over the past few years. Sleeping became even more difficult as her brain began to move in the only logical direction, as every memory of how everyone treated her brother was played out in bright colors and surround sound. No, she said in a soft voice. I think he knows his family abandoned him. I joined the Army Corps of Engineers when I left home. I went to college and worked part-time for a company until I graduated. My degree was in civil engineering and I also completed an MBA. Of course, Jimmy was going to lead the company, but I would also be part of the executive team. That was the plan anyway. Now I began to make other plans. My plans have changed since I first left home. My new plan was great, and today it should come to fruition. I couldn't help but smile as I watched my little sister enter the building across the street. She looked at me, but it was obvious that she didn't recognize me. I have changed a lot over the past 10 years. I had some time, so I thought back to the last few years. As I already mentioned, I joined the Army. With my education and background, I was welcomed with open arms. I found myself in a sandbox, rebuilding infrastructure. I had a lot of free time, so I used it for training, including weapons training, and I even hired a couple of special forces guys to teach me hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not that I needed it, but I wanted to improve my strength and be able to defend myself if necessary. It took six months before I was enlisted in the Army. 
By this point, I had been promoted to captain and my commanding officer was making noise about re-enlisting. To be honest, I really thought about it. We were heading to a new place when this happened. An improvised explosive device exploded as we drove past. Our Hummer was destroyed, but managed to survive most of the blast and shrapnel. I was wounded, but at that moment, I didn't think it was severe, and yet it hurt like hell. I heard shots ringing out around me as I tried to get out of the destroyed car. It was then that I noticed that the lady we were accompanying, one of the members of Parliament, was indeed seriously wounded. Her leg was badly damaged, and she was losing a lot of blood. I had just grabbed the first aid kit to start trying to slow her blood loss when someone screamed that the car was on fire. Putting the first aid kit in my hand, I unfastened her seatbelt and managed to get her out of the car and drag her to a place where we had some kind of shelter. I managed to slow the bleeding while the gunfire raged around us. Once I had done all I could for her, I took up my rifle and went into action, doing my best to keep the enemy away from our position. I didn't care how much blood I was losing myself as I knelt next to her, shooting at anyone who looked like they were trying to get to us. 20 minutes later, I was completely exhausted when I heard the flapping sounds of helicopters overhead. My body finally gave in as soon as I saw the paramedics running towards us. Sons of bitches! Load these two onto an evacuation helicopter immediately! I heard someone scream, and then everything plunged into darkness. My eyes opened to a pair of green lakes surrounded by the face of an angel with shiny red hair. I am in heaven, I muttered. The angel's eyebrows furrowed, and then her face brightened. Why do you think so? She asked in a sweet, melodious voice. I was sure that I would survive, but apparently I died. Why do you think you're dead? Well, I've never died before, so I can't be sure, but I would think that when someone wakes up and sees an angel looking at them, that would be a clear sign that they have died. Her face changed to a cheerful one as she started laughing. Sorry to disappoint you, but I'm far from an angel. Actually, I'm a lawyer. I smiled. All this means is that I'm in a different place, but I really don't mind as long as I can keep seeing you here. Well, if it's up to me, you'll see me often. Luckily for both of us, it won't be in hell. You, my brave soldier hero, are still alive. You are currently in a hospital in Germany. You were treated at the base and then brought here. Fine. So since you said that you are a lawyer and not a nurse, I would like to know who you are and why you are here with me. Not that I'm complaining, but I'm not sure suing the rebels for pain and suffering would really work. She laughed again. I really liked her laugh. No, I'm not here to try to sue the rebels. I'm here to thank you for saving my sister's life. My name is Rebecca Caulfield. My sister June was the MP you pulled out of the Hummer and gave him first aid. Everyone I spoke to emphatically stated that if you had not done what you did, she would have died. So, how is she doing? Will she be okay? I asked. She'll be fine. They were able to save her leg, but she will always have a slight limp. That's how I got to meet Becca and her sister. True to her word, Rebecca spent her days in Germany, dividing her time between me and her sister. I decided not to return to the army, and was discharged with a Purple Heart and Silver Star. When I returned to the States, I continued to see Rebecca. We got along very well and started dating. I told her everything about my past and how my ex-wife and family betrayed me. I told her about my plan for revenge. Simply put, I would start my own construction company and compete with them. Being in the military, I never really needed a lot of money. I invested as much as I could until I finally had enough money to start my plans. Being intimately familiar with my family's business, I knew all the ways to undermine them and start stealing their clients and best employees. I probably wouldn't be able to put them out of business completely, but I could become more successful and reduce their income significantly. Rebecca thought about it for a moment, then smiled slyly. How would you like to actually burn them? Then she told me her plan. I liked it. I really liked it. As it turns out, Rebecca's parents are really rich, really rich. They also loved me very much and were seriously angry at my family for what they did to me. 
It was also convenient that her older brother was a genius financial wizard. Using a combination of assets, a new LLC was created. Rebecca's father, nearly retired, was named president of the company. Her brother was named acting CFO, and Rebecca was named acting CEO. This was done to ensure that my name did not appear in the books. Although I pretty much ran things. The first thing we did was buy out a small construction company that was poorly managed. The turnaround was quick once I took control of operations. Six months later, we added another company. By the time we were ready for the finale, we had acquired five more companies in different parts of the country. Rebecca and I also became very close and started dating. Now I sat here, across the street from my family's business, waiting to get my revenge. Over the past few years, I have become quite wealthy thanks to my investments and the success of our new company. Rebecca and I also got engaged within the last month. I smiled, waiting to burn my former family. They had no idea what was about to hit them. What they didn't know was that a couple of very specific people were quietly buying up every publicly traded stock that was on the market. Just a week ago, these investors finally passed the necessary threshold for the plan to succeed. Steph was in a very bad mood. Not that being in a bad mood was unusual for her. In fact, this has pretty much been her way of life for the past few years. She wasn't stupid. She knew that almost everyone who worked at the company disliked her. Damn them, she thought. As CFO and daughter of the board chairman, she could do whatever she wanted. Besides, if things got too bad, she would just talk to her older brother who was the CEO. It was a family company. Anyone who crosses her path will soon be in line for unemployment benefits. However, this was not the source of her concern at the moment. She was upset because an unscheduled board meeting had been called. This was highly unusual. Typically, the board met only once a quarter. Most meetings took place around the family table. The board of directors met only to confirm the decisions that had already been made between her parents, brother, and herself. After all, between the four of them and the proxy votes of her absent middle brother, they controlled 60% of the shares. Each family member owned 12% of the shares. An explanation is needed here. A few years ago, the family, minus Sam, who left without a word, decided a major expansion was needed. The decision was made to go public and sell shares to raise capital for expansion. The family ensured that each family member retained a 12% stake, thereby maintaining control of 60% of the company. Although no formal agreement was made with Sam, his shares were used for voting along with those of other family members. No one paid much attention to this, since he refused any contact with them. He even refused to come to Jimmy and Camilla's wedding after Sam divorced her. None of the family even knew where he had gone or where he was now. After 10 years of silence on his part, it was simply assumed that his votes belonged to the family and they could do whatever they wanted with them. Steph paused, about to open the door to the office building. On the other side of the street stood a tall, well-built figure of a man. She only managed to glance at him briefly and he seemed somehow familiar to her. At that moment, a bus passed by and the figure disappeared. Shrugging, she opened the door and entered the building. Steph was very bored during the meeting. Procedure still had to be followed, although the board had recently met last month and was not due to meet again for another two months. The minutes of the last meeting were read out. An old case where they repeated what was discussed last month. Updates across various divisions. No changes since last month. Any new business, of course, was... I am filing a motion to remove the chairman of the board for gross incompetence and moral failings, said the attractive brunette. She must have had some kind of injury because I noticed a slight limp when she walked. It was then that Steph noticed that there were far fewer people than usual at a board meeting. None of the major shareholders she was used to seeing were present. Instead, there were a few very small shareholders, a brunette who filed a petition and a blonde who had never been there before. I support this proposal, the blonde shouted. What the hell is going on here? Steph thought. Of course, they were delusional, thinking that they could go through something like that. In the end, the family had 60% of the votes. It was simply impossible. This stupid woman was close to being completely crushed. 
Everyone except the two stupid women were shocked by this movement. The discussion was lively but short. Voting began with the expected result. Miss Caulfield with 35% of the shared votes? Yes, obviously, since she proposed. Miss Jeffers with 4% of the votes? Yes, said the blonde. Again, this was expected since she supported the proposal. There were several more people who voted against. There, the calculation reached 1% of shares. So, 39% yes, 1% no, and the family with 60% has not yet voted. Of course, Jimmy, me, mom, and dad all voted no. After all, dad was the chairman. 49% no, against 39% yes. Just as Jimmy stood up as Sam's confidant to put us in an advantageous position, the door swung open and in walked the tall man I'd spotted across the street. Yes, Samuel Johnson with 12% of the vote, said my brother, whom I had not seen or heard for 10 years. That's how quickly our family business was taken away from us and given to our brother, whom we abandoned in favor of our older brother. From that moment on, the meeting went downhill. Samuel was appointed chairman of the board in place of the Pope. Jimmy was summarily fired and replaced by a blonde. I was also fired from my position as CFO and replaced with a brunette. Since none of us could ever imagine such a scenario, we never bothered with contracts. Therefore, there was no severance pay. Golden parachutes, more like lead balls. Ten minutes to pack your things and leave the area. This was good news. All our houses and cars were company property. It was created this way for tax purposes. Sam was nice enough to give us all a week to pack up and leave. Well, all of us except Jimmy and Camilla. They only had 24 hours. Mom, Dad, Jimmy, Camilla, and I just sat there dumbfounded while Sam led the meeting. Although all power in the company had just been taken away from us, we were still major shareholders and had every right to remain there at the meeting. At least we still had our shares and the income from them. As long as the company existed and was profitable, we should be fine. True, none of us actually had a lot of money in our accounts, only about 100000 each for emergencies. Since the company paid for our mortgage, utilities, cell phones, and vehicles, we really didn't need much to live. Instead, we all agreed to put most of the profits back into the company and grow it. The plan was to cash out later so we could all retire comfortably while we were still young enough to enjoy it. Okay, Sam said, taking charge of the meeting. Any other questions? Yes. There is one more issue to discuss, an attractive brunette stated, SRJ. Enterprise made a buyout offer. I assume that you have already had the opportunity to familiarize yourself with the terms of the buyout. The quick version is that they will buy all available shares provided they can acquire at least 51% of the company. Once this is completed, Johnson Construction, Inc. will be closed and all assets will be absorbed by SRJ Enterprise. Okay, what about all the employees? We have a lot of really good people working here, and I don't want them to suddenly find themselves unemployed and unable to support their families. Mr. Johnson, all non-managerial employees will simply continue to work as before. The only difference they will see is the company name on their checks. Our clients will still work with people they know, all executives will either be fired or transferred to similar positions at SRJ. I should mention that they asked the chairman of the board, CEO and CFO to move into the same positions as SRJ. Their current chairman will resign, as will their CEO and CFO. What about those who do not want to sell their shares? Sam asked, looking at us intently. I'm sure there will be those who don't want to sell. Oh well. The SRJ rep actually said that once they get 51%, the purchase price of any remaining shares will be drastically reduced. Obviously, they won't actually need the additional shares, and when news comes out about what their plan is, the value of the shares outstanding will plummet. Any holdouts will find their investment gone. Very good. Is the representative here? Yes, she's waiting in the lobby. She wanted to be available as she hoped to start this today. Would you like to call security and ask to be escorted inside? Sam called security, and a few minutes later an absolute goddess strutted through the doors. She was about 5'7", 
tall, with long, luxurious red hair down to her waist, emerald green eyes, a beautiful face with a light sprinkling of freckles on her thin nose, large breasts, and a thin waist that flared out to really nice hips. She wore a charcoal pencil skirt, a matching jacket, and a light pink blouse. Her long, toned legs were covered in silk stockings, and she wore four-inch Prada heels. I was wondering what the hell is going on with all these attractive women who somehow show up today and steal our company from us. Besides, what did Sam have to do with this? It was becoming abundantly clear that he was part of this plan. We haven't heard a peep from him for ten years and he suddenly shows up today of all days. He then proceeds to vote for his family to get out of the business Dad started. What the hell was he doing? Why did he do this? So, as I said earlier, we are offering $120 per share for the first 51%. After that, anyone who wants to sell will be offered $2 per share. It's simply not worth anything more to us once we gain majority control. Shit. I missed the first part of what she said. I really regretted not listening. The decline from $120 per share to $2 per share was catastrophic. Of course, I didn't really want to sell, but not selling would have been devastating. I quickly stood up and shouted that I wanted to sell. Better get in line early while I can. A dazzling smile appeared on the redhead's face as she turned to me. Certainly. We will be happy to purchase your shares. You are currently fourth in line, so I will make you our offer as soon as I complete the first three transactions. My stomach churned as I made a calculated guess as to who the first three sellers were. Being fourth was almost the same as being last. I watched as Sam, then the blonde, then the brunette, all signed an agreement to sell their shares. She already had her 51%. All our money was invested in the company. In another five years, we planned to sell and cash out. We would be multi-millionaires. Now we will be lucky if we become simply wealthy. We all had to go home to start packing up. Security confiscated our cars and office keys before we were allowed to leave the premises. We had to make arrangements with security to come the next day and clear out our offices. The blonde announced that she would deny all of us access to the company's servers and that our logins would be deactivated within the next few minutes. It wasn't really a big deal because our laptops had been confiscated earlier. The blonde also informed us that our home computers would be confiscated the next day. Additionally, if any evidence is found that we attempted to delete or corrupt any files before they got there, Serious charges of corporate espionage, fraud, tampering with evidence, and theft will be brought. Jimmy was informed that his computer was confiscated by IT immediately after the vote to remove Dad from office. Oh, and we have a forensic accountant already looking at the books. Sam smiled. It was the next evening when everyone gathered at their parents' house. Jimmy, Camilla, and their three children arrived in a van full of everything they could hastily pack into it. With short notice and no other options, they will be moving in with Jacob and Evelyn as they have agreed on different living arrangements for the rest of the week. After the truck was temporarily unloaded into the garage, family members gathered around the table to plan for the future. Fine. We need to figure out how we will react. We can't just sit back and tolerate this. We need to fight back and take back what is ours, Jacob stated. Great, Evelyn answered. But what are we going to do? How can we fight this? Where do we even start? We will contact our lawyers and begin filing claims. But, Dad? We don't have any lawyers. The lawyers work for the company, and we no longer control the company. We would have to hire other lawyers, and they cost money. Now I know we all have accounts where we've been hiding money, but this is going to be a long legal fight, and right now, I need all the cash I can live on until I find another job and get back on my feet, Stephanie said. Maybe it's time for me to visit my little brother, Jimmy chuckled, cracking his knuckles. Camilla looked at her husband critically. She got a good look at her tall, muscular, and confident ex-husband as he rode them around in the boardroom. I would strongly advise against doing this, she said. It didn't end well for you the last time you tried it and now he looks a lot tougher and stronger than he did back then. Jimmy started to say something and then went quiet. Stephanie listened to him and added criticism to every stupid idea. She listened to an idea that no one had mentioned. It was the only thing that had even the slightest chance. 
She knew it wouldn't fix everything, but it might make their current situation a little easier. Maybe we could just go and talk to him. The sudden silence was deafening as everyone in the room suddenly looked in her direction, as if she had suddenly grown a third eye. Maybe if we went up and talked to him and asked for forgiveness for the way we treated him. Maybe if we begged him for mercy, he wouldn't be so harsh. Obviously, he will never take it all back. But maybe if we bow before him and admit that we were so wrong in the way we treated him, he might just ease our pain enough that we can survive and not be completely destroyed. Pandemonium ensued. You expect me to walk up to him with my tail between my legs and humiliate myself in front of this brat after he abandoned his family? And then he comes back here ten years later without a word and stabs his own flesh and blood in the back? Are you crazy? I will never disgrace myself by bowing to that ungrateful bastard, Jacob roared. Seriously, sis? After the way he treated me and my wife before he ran away, and then what he did today, do you really think I could do anything other than find a way to put him back under that slippery rock? From which he crawled? Hell no! Jimmy shouted. Even Camilla screamed her disgust at groveling before her weak ex-husband. Jimmy is ten times bigger than Sam. There is no way I would embarrass myself or my husband by begging this weakling for anything. Darling, her mother said in the voice of a mother who loves her daughter but must reproach her for ignorance. I understand what you're thinking, but we need to start a war with a man who has encroached on the well-being of our family. Now is the time to fight back, not admit defeat. No, we will not talk to our new enemy. We will find a way to attack and take what is ours. She finished. Having completely dismissed Steph's idiotic idea, the discussion returned to possible ways to fight back. Steph remained silent as the conversation continued around her. She had already decided what she needed to do for herself. She needed to jump off the platform before the train crashed. She realized too late what their loving family had done to her older brother. But by then, Sam had disappeared. She never got the chance to tell him how sorry she was for her words and actions. She was a self-centered, spoiled child back then. Her epiphany came two weeks later than it should have. June Caulfield looked up when the secretary ushered Stephanie Johnson into her office the next morning. She noticed that Stephanie was wearing a very nice dark blue pencil skirt, matching jacket, powder-colored blouse, black stockings, and four-inch heels. Overall, it was a very nice but conservative look. Stephanie's blonde hair was styled professionally, and her makeup was applied tastefully. Even though June had heard all the stories about what a cast-iron bitch Steph was, she was still very attractive. Gesturing the visitor to sit down, June began this rather unexpected meeting. What can I do for you, Miss Johnson? To be honest, I'm a little surprised by your visit here this morning. Yeah, well, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would be surprised by my presence here. I actually came today to talk to Samuel, but was told he wasn't expected. They suggested that you could give him a message. Maybe... This will obviously depend on what message needs to be conveyed. As you can probably tell from current events, he really isn't very interested in talking to your family. Just so we can understand each other, I've heard all the stories about you and your whole family. To be very clear, I don't like either of you very much either after the way you treated him. So I take it you two are close then? Steph asked. She might as well get all the information she could about the new players in this game. Maybe if she could win over this woman and show that she truly regretted her criminal actions, she could convince her brother to help her. Yes, we're close, but probably not as close as you think. We're not dating. We're just very good friends. In fact, he is more like a brother to me than anyone else. Oh, could you tell me how you met? I could, but I really don't think it's any of your business right now. Maybe some other time, but I'm pretty busy preparing for a takeover by a new company, so what message do you have for Samuel? This was it. She needed to make the attractive woman understand that she truly regretted her previous behavior. Please tell Sam that I really need to talk to him. I know what my past behavior was like and I am truly sorry for it. Unfortunately, I realized this about two weeks later than I should have. By then, he had already left. I know everyone else is trying to figure out a way to deal with his actions, but I'm not going to be a part of it. 
I just want to be able to look him in the eyes and tell him how sorry I am for the way I behaved. Yes, I hope he will show me some mercy, but I'm not even going to suggest that he exclude me from whatever punishment we face. I hope he will allow me to have some kind of relationship with him. I want him to know that I will be separated from the rest of the family. I want to do this because I realize they were wrong, and I don't want anything to do with them anymore. I'm not even going to ask him to trust me. I just want to be able to see and talk to the brother I foolishly threw away. Steph sobbed. June looked at the crying woman and sighed. She had enough experience with some of her former lovers, as well as the employees she had to fire, to know the difference between crocodile tears and real tears of grief and loss. She could tell easily enough that Steph was sincere. Fine, look, Sam's out of town for a few days. He won't be back until Monday. I'll give him your message and see if I can get him to schedule some time for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do not worry about it. I'll tell you what. How about we meet tonight for drinks and dinner? I don't know anyone here, and I'd like to talk to you a little more and find out what exactly you expect from all these events. To say that Stephanie was taken aback by the proposal would be an understatement. She found June to be a very attractive woman, and Steph really liked women, although she never let the rest of her family know about it. She went to parties and events with different guys to keep up the ploy, but whenever she was out of town, she looked for another woman. It would also give her the opportunity to learn more about the woman and her relationship with her brother. She might also find out more about the blonde and redhead who helped ambush her and her family. Not that she intended to use this information to help others in their struggles. Quite the contrary, she wanted information so she could use it to help her form a new relationship with Samuel. It would be better if she could attract allies to her side. So tell me more about what you expect. June asked a few hours later at the bar where she and Stephanie met. I pretty much said it all before. All I really want is a new and better relationship with Sam. I know I screwed up and I accept it. Trust me, at this point I will gladly accept any mercy he decides to show me. But even if he decides to throw me out on the street, I still want to show him that I have changed and want to be a better sister to him. How do I know you're not just saying this to get information to use against him? Honestly, you don't know. You have no reason to trust me. Same as Sam. I'm curious what happened to him in the last 10 years. I can see that he is important to you and that you have a serious relationship with him. Being completely honest here, I really want to know more about you and the other two women. I want this because if I can get my brother back, I think I should know the people who are important to him. If they are important to my brother, they must also be important to me. You said you're like a sister to him. This means that I should also be like a sister to you. After all, if you are his sister, that makes you my sister too. Maybe you can teach me how to be a better sister to Sam than I was in the past. This is an interesting proposal. This sounds plausible. So, you're obviously an attractive woman, and you seem to be pretty close to Sam. Why aren't you two dating? Steph asked. Something about it didn't make sense to her. June laughed. Fine, there are actually two reasons for this. I can tell you this because there's really nothing in it that you could use against us anyway. The first reason is that Sam is already in a relationship with someone else. In fact, they are engaged. The second reason is that, how should I put it? Let's just say that you're much more my type than Sam. June grinned. This confused Stephanie. So how did you two meet? I'd really like to know. We met in the army. He pulled me out of the wrecked car and saved my life. He was also wounded, but not so badly. By the way, it was there that I injured my leg. My family was duly grateful and we sort of adopted him after hearing his story. Oh, wow. We didn't even know he served in the army. He just left without saying a word. Yesterday we heard from him for the first time. Yes, I know, he did it on purpose. I understand. We really didn't treat him very well. So, you mentioned he's engaged? Yeah. As soon as he's done here, they'll get married. Can you tell me who she is? Is this the blonde? No. In fact, she is engaged to my older brother. No, Sam is engaged to my sister. I think it was love at first sight for both of them when Sam woke up in the hospital in Germany. I would really like to know that he was injured. I would be next to him. 
Yeah. Well, Becca really rushed into taking care of him to get him back to health. She's a real bear when it comes to protecting him. Trust me, you don't want her to think that you want to hurt him in any way. She's a tough lawyer, and I've seen the wreckage she leaves behind when she really wants to destroy her opponent in court. That is, if the case actually goes to trial. She can just tear you apart with her bare hands. I saw her do this several times. Looks like I really need to meet her and make sure I don't get in her way. Actually, you've already met her, and sweet cheeks, you're already on her bad side. Is this a redhead? Yeah. She hates every one of you. It's her you really need to win. They both got hungry and went to a restaurant next door. The conversation continued as both women learned more about each other. June was very careful with her words, as she did not intend to give any information about Sam's plans. Steph did ask about SRJ Enterprise, but June refused to answer any questions about it. The meal was over, and the two women were drinking the last of their wine. Okay, June. You said I need to win over your sister Rebecca to have any chance of having any kind of relationship with Sam, Stephanie said. She worked on this throughout the last half of her dinner. Yeah, she is his gatekeeper, June replied. Well, I have a foolproof plan for this. Tell, June smiled. Just how are you going to turn my barracuda sister from a demon from the depths of hell into the loving sister you claim to be? It's simple. First, I'm going to win you, and then you're going to win your sister for me. Interesting concept, June grinned. And how do you propose to win me over? Oh, I think it will be quite simple. To put it simply, my plan is to take you to my place and entertain you all night long. After that, you will be sick tomorrow, so I can continue all day and also on the weekend. I fully believe that when you finally show up to work on Monday morning, you will be more than ready to tell your sister what an amazing woman I am and that you would really like her to welcome your new girlfriend with open arms. I understand. So. What's to stop me from rejecting your advances and making me believe that you're serious about becoming my girlfriend? Actually, two things. First of all, you have already mentioned that I am your type and I believe that you are truly attracted to me. Secondly, I just told you my biggest secret. None of my family or friends know about my preferences. Nobody even suspects it. This will reveal my secret to the whole world. I've never done this for anyone before. My willingness to reveal my true self and come out of the closet should convince you that I am completely serious. If you have any doubts about it after this weekend, just watch how my parents and Jimmy disown me when it happens. I already told you that I will reject them. This will only make the problem worse and prove my intentions. Lord, sister, what happened to you? You look terrible, Rebecca shouted to her little sister when June finally managed to stagger into the office on Monday morning. Severe lack of sleep caused by three wonderful days. If you think I look bad, you should go see my new girlfriend. June answered. Wow. Okay, so who is this new girlfriend? And how did this happen so quickly? Asked Rebecca. I'll tell you what. Give me some caffeine, and then I need to meet you and Sam for a little while. I have some news for both of you. How about in 20 minutes in Sam's office? Certainly. Go have some coffee. You look like you need it. So, June, what am I hearing about the new girl? Sam asked when a shabby June entered his office. Well, I had a surprise visitor on Thursday while you two were out of town. It turned into an even more amazing dinner and then into a full weekend. Now, it seems to me that I have an even more shocking friend. Okay, so who is it? Becca asked worriedly. June let the tension build for a minute, looking from her sister to her future brother-in-law, and back again. Her name is Stephanie Johnson. She watched the two faces in front of her as they went from happy and smiling to shocked. Several minutes passed before either of them could utter a word. My sister? Well, sort of, but I did find out some interesting information about her and the rest of your family. Before you get too worked up, I did some research between the time she left my office and the time I met her later that evening. She seemed to come to her senses right after you left. 
In fact, she is very sorry for the way she treated you before. Of course, you don't just take her word for it, even if she had sex with you all weekend. Of course not. And my name is June. Not stupid. June giggled as Sam and Rebecca rolled their eyes at the stupid joke. Seriously, I did some research on this. Several longtime employees commented on how she acted rather sad right after you left. She seemed very unhappy and depressed for a few months and mentioned that she really missed you. Could it have just been people loyal to her who fed you lies to help her? I doubt it. Remember, Kate? Even she told me about it. Sam did remember the old secretary in the accounts receivable department. He knew that he and Steph really hated each other. If Kate said it, then it was probably true. Okay, but I'm pretty sure Steph doesn't prefer women. Actually, that's how it is. She is 100% like that. Believe me, she was very well versed in the intricacies of female love. That's one of the things that helped her convince me. She's coming out of the closet for the chance to talk to you and try to build a better relationship. She completely abandons the rest of the family. Sounds kind of selfish to me. I think she sees what's coming and is trying to take care of herself. I don't doubt that's part of it, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. I suggest hiring her as my assistant so we can keep an eye on her. This will also help you understand how sincere she is. Worst case scenario, we can always use it to get information about everyone else, June suggested. Why the hell not, Sam agreed. Obviously, we will have tracking software on her computers, tablets, and phones to see if she tries to stab us in the back. Make an appointment with the three of us for this afternoon. We'll ask your brother to set up the software and offer her a job after the meeting, if all goes well. Just make sure you think with your highbrow brain and not your below-the-belt brain. Rebecca teased her sister as they ended their meeting. Sam sat at his desk in shock as he listened to his sister talk later that day. He was surprised by the vitriol she spewed when she talked about their parents, brother, and especially Camilla. She described how she had to play nice for the past 10 years because she had no other options and needed to stay on the good side of the family. She also provided extensive information about the family's company activities, accounts, and plans to try to regain control. When asked about her seemingly sudden change in sexual preference, she spoke very openly about her past. She confirmed that she was now completely out of the closet and proudly stated that she had no doubt that it would ruin any relationship with their very bigoted family. I have been unhappy for the last 10 years. I'm so sorry that I didn't realize anything before you left, but by then it was too late. Even if you reject me now, I'm just happy that I have the chance to finally apologize to you for my past behavior. Steph concluded. Fine, I accept your apologies. It seems really genuine, and I'm even willing to try and see if we can make some kind of relationship work. Unfortunately, there is a trust issue. Considering your past behavior towards me and your relationship with the rest of your family, I simply don't trust you. You have every reason to deceive us, since I have pretty much taken everything from you. However, it seems my future sister-in-law thinks you deserve a chance. Keep in mind that we will be watching you very closely, and any mistake on your part will have dire consequences. Don't ruin it all. Well, what is SRJ Enterprise? Steph asked. I've never heard of this company before. SRJ stands for Samuel, Rebecca, and June. We own the company, so it didn't really matter what we offered for our own shares, in reality, we would still just be paying ourselves with our own money. Hmm. You should have guessed this. Stephanie never moved out of her home. Instead, June moved in and let her girlfriend live with her. Sam and Becca continued to be amazed at how well their relationship was going. It seemed like Stephanie was really attracted to June and was really working on developing their relationship. Stephanie accepted the position as June's assistant and seemed to enjoy working under her, Sam has really opened up to her and Steph and Sam develop a better brotherly relationship with each other. It helps that Steph and Sam are dating sisters and often seeing their respective partners. Yes, she was disowned by her parents and older brother when she happily told them that she was living with her girlfriend. She really enjoyed hearing her mother scream when she told them exactly who her girlfriend was. 
Jimmy and Camilla could only watch as their former home was taken over by Dave and his fiance. Feeling slightly sorry for Jimmy and Camilla's children, they were innocent victims. Sam relented on some of the revenge he was planning for his brother and ex-wife. Instead of being unemployed forever and forcing them into the poorhouse, Sam offered them a job. Of course, several months passed and they were on the verge of being evicted from the cheap apartment they were renting before the two of them finally swallowed their pride and agreed. Of course, the job they were offered was not what they had hoped for. Sam, being quite popular in the community, quietly made it clear that he would have nothing to do with anyone who hired any of his former family. As for Jacob and Evelyn, they tried to sue Sam to force him to leave and give them the company back. In truth, it was a pretty weak case. But they managed to find a little-known law firm desperate for cases to take on the challenge. This lasted approximately 30 seconds after the first hearing. Jacob and Evelyn's two lawyers watched as the striking red-haired woman entered the courtroom to the defendant's table. Then they looked at each other, then collected their briefcases and informed their clients that they were withdrawing from the case, practically running out of the courtroom. Later, when Jacob and his wife burst into the law office to ask what the hell happened, two lawyers informed them of the disaster in progress. Don't you know who their lawyer is? Asked one of the partners. Of course we know, Jacob replied. This is the bitch who represents the corporation that bought us out. She is also apparently the fiancé of our disinherited son. Then you really don't know, said the second partner, shaking his head. This is Rebecca Caulfield. To be completely honest with you, your case is really weak. Either way, you only had a slim chance of winning. We were really hoping that they would decide that fighting in court would be too expensive and offer a settlement. At worst, their lawyers will simply review the case on its merits and probably get it dismissed. Rebecca is completely different, especially since you just mentioned that she is engaged to your son, whom you seem to clearly hate. This makes the matter personal for her. She won't be satisfied with just winning the case. She will chew you up, spit you out, and then completely humiliate and destroy you. She will then turn her attention to the person introducing you. We may be desperate for a job, but we're not so desperate that we'd be completely destroyed by taking on a lost cause against the most ruthless Barracuda on the planet. With their funds running low and no other options, the couple had no choice but to move into a small, one-bedroom apartment that they could afford on Social Security. Evelyn spends her days as an unpaid nanny for Jimmy and Camilla's children, as her eldest son and daughter-in-law work. Jacob spends his days in Misery, sitting on the couch and complaining about how his life has turned out. An elderly couple does not communicate with their youngest son or daughter. They rarely see their eldest son because of his work. Let me come in, Mr. Johnson, the store cashier said quietly, entering Sam's office. Yes, Camilla, what can I do for you? He replied, smiling at his ex-wife and now daughter-in-law. Well, I was wondering if there was any way you could transfer Jimmy to work somewhere closer to us. Due to him working out of state for the past few months, we only see each other one day every two weeks. Even then, he is usually too tired to do anything. Well, I'm sorry, Camilla, but all the jobs for the workers closer are filled. To move Jimmy closer, I would have to move another worker to take his place. I would simply replace your difficulties with other people's difficulties. This would not be very fair to the other person and his family. The once attractive blonde began to sob. Please, Sa, I mean, Mr. Johnson, I know that you despise us and punish us for what we have done, but I am in despair. I haven't made love to my husband for months. I will do whatever you ask. Please, please, please let me see my husband. She simply begged him. It seems she wants to meet her husband. A familiar female voice came over the speakerphone. Maybe she doesn't really mean it, another female voice added. From what she told me when I was meeting with my family to come out of the closet, I don't buy what she sells, the third woman said. Yes, Sam was on conference call with his fiance, future sister-in-law, and sister as soon as his secretary told him that Camille wanted to talk to him. He was pretty sure the conversation would be about something and he wanted those closest to him to listen and enjoy it. Well, Camilla, looks like no one is really buying it. Perhaps you should be a little more specific about what exactly you are willing to do. Frankly, 
I don't really like the idea of this man you call a husband being closer to me than absolutely necessary. If we could find work in Siberia, I would send him there. Why in the name of all that is holy would I even consider moving it any closer? At least now he can come home every other weekend. But it's an eight-hour drive. He returns home late on Friday night, needs to rest on Saturday, and leaves again on Sunday morning. Since he is just a worker and earns barely more than minimum wage, he is so tired by the time he gets home that he simply sleeps all day. Well, Camilla, I'm not entirely sure this is my problem. If things don't work out between the two of you, you can quit and find another job. You know that's not an option. You know we've already tried this. We can't afford to pack up and move somewhere else, and no one here will hire us again after they find out what happened. I understand that you hate us and what we did, but can't you show an ounce of compassion? Again, why do I need this? You two never had any compassion for me. In fact, you rubbed it in my face. You two never even showed the slightest bit of remorse for what you did to me. All you regret now is that I take revenge on you. It's not because of what you did to me. Seeing that there were no words that could sway her ex-husband, Camille knew she had to rely on the only thing she had left. I'll do anything. Honestly, she was hoping Sam would accept her offer and just have sex with her. Sam was bigger than Jimmy, and she always enjoyed the sex she had with him. She only gave in to Jimmy when she realized that Jimmy would be the one to inherit the company and be more successful. Next to the word gold digger in the dictionary was her photograph. Perhaps, she thought, she could win back her ex-husband and throw this stubborn, red-haired bitch out onto the street. After all, she was extremely upset about the lack of sex lately. Besides, she knew she could entertain Sam senselessly if given the chance. She was only slightly concerned that this conversation was with a red-haired bitch and two disgusting individuals who were having fun with each other. Okay, Bika squeak it through the speaker. How about this? Sam, you and I have discussed the idea of having a threesome with another woman. I sincerely doubt I would return the favor, but I wouldn't mind seeing if it made any difference. Camilla's horror at this thought only intensified when June spoke. Oh, yeah. Steph and I also discussed the possibility of picking up another woman and using her as our plaything for one night. Jimmy isn't supposed to be back this weekend, so maybe you guys can play with her on Saturday and we can have her over on Sunday. Sam thought for a moment before answering. That sounds like a plan. June, you and Steph can do whatever you want. Great! June was delighted. On Monday morning, Camille somehow managed to hobble gingerly to work. She just hoped Sam would keep his end of the deal. Good news, Steph announced as Camille entered. Your husband will finish where he is this week and then return for the weekend. Next week, he will begin construction on a new building here in town. Camilla was relieved by this news. Given her terrible relationship with them, she was worried that they would back out of the deal. You lousy ass! You set me up! Camille screamed as she burst into Sam's office Thursday afternoon. She had just been served with divorce papers. The divorce papers included several graphic photographs of Camille having sex with multiple women and one man. The faces of everyone except Camilla were very carefully blurred in the photographs. He kicks me out of the apartment and declares that I am an unfit mother for children. Camilla continued to scream. Her tirade continued for another 10 minutes and attracted a sizable crowd. The crowd apparently included Rebecca, June, and Stephanie. Despite her screams, Sam simply sat back in his chair silently with a smile on his face. He didn't say anything until Camille finally calmed down and started sobbing. Becca, as a company lawyer, what are my options for such serious charges brought against us by one of our cashiers? Well, Mr. Johnson, as far as the evidence I've seen here, she has no evidence that you, I, or anyone else at the firm had anything to do with her promiscuous behavior. My opinion on this matter is that she has found herself in a very compromising position and she is grasping at straws to find any way to find anything that will save her reputation and strengthen her financially. 
My advice is to fire her for cause, for creating a hostile work environment. Lord knows our security cameras caught enough of her false accusations to justify this. Sam sighed. Very good. Even though she hurt me when she left me for my brother, I really hope that by helping them and hiring them when no one else would, I could somehow heal the rift in our family. It finally worked out when we hired Stephanie. Let it be so. Camilla, I have no choice but to let you go. Please notify HR. They will explain your rights and options. Your final check will be delivered to you before departure. But I have nowhere to go. Jimmy kicked me out and filed a restraining order. Without this job, I won't even be able to rent another apartment or get a hotel room for the night, she whined. Sure, she could move across the country, but what kind of life would that be? She wouldn't have the references to get any decent jobs. How would she explain the huge gap in her work experience? The best she could hope for was a minimum wage job that likely wouldn't even support her and would never allow her to see her children again. Her next option was to live on the streets here and beg for spare change to survive. She will at least see her children from time to time, even if it is supervised visitation. Jacob and Evelyn lived the rest of their lives on the brink of poverty, subsisting only on their social security. Their hatred and anger continued to prevent them from reaching Sam. Their fanaticism also prevented them from making any attempts to contact their daughter. The only joy they found was watching their grandchildren born to their eldest son. Jimmy continued to exist in his low-paying job, working as a laborer for his brother's company. They explained to him that his chances of promotion were zero. He tried several times to find a better job, but was rejected at every turn. He didn't have the skills needed for any particular profession, and his background and business degree were tainted enough by the way he lost his company that no one wanted to take a chance on him. He tried dating for a while but found very few women willing to waste time on a single father who was a loser with very limited means. Sam and Rebecca got married and had three children. All three of their children were equally loved and should have been equal heirs. There would be no favorites in this house. June and Stephanie also got married. Although their relationship began under strange circumstances, they fell in love with each other unconditionally. Likewise, Stephanie and Sam also developed a strong relationship as brother and sister. Stephanie gave birth to two children. The donor was June's older brother, and they used artificial insemination to conceive. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.